Hello everyone and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics and much much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click the notification button below so that you never miss your favorite educational videos and tutorials on your topic of interest. My name is Sava and today we are finishing our discussion of various heteroscedasticity tests. In the prior videos we have extensively covered various tests such as the bruce pagan test, the goldfield Quant test and the modifications of the bruce pagan test such as the Harvey test or the Gleiser test. And today we are talking about something a little bit different, that is about heteroscedasticity that is quite common and quite prominent in time series particularly. The tests that we discussed previously are mostly uh, related to cross-sectional heteroscedasticity, albeit sometimes they occur in time series also, albeit not that often. The go-to technique for investigating the presence of heteroscedasticity in time series is the so-called ARSH test, that is autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity. ARSH, that is, is just an abbreviation. What is, conceptually, the autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity? Well, to understand it, you have to kind of envision how volatility of a particular financial time series behaves. If you have an unexpected, that is, high positive or high negative abnormal return in the prior day, the logic of Arsh modeling forecasts that in the following day, after this unexpected spike, the volatility will be higher than it would otherwise have been. That is, it models volatility as a non-constant process with volatility spikes and uh, subsequent relaxation of volatility. And uh, empirically it has been shown in the 80s that processes like that are really useful to describe the behavior of some microeconomic series. Initially, uh, Engel applied Arsh models to describe the behavior of inflation series, but later on it has become even more prominent in describing the volatility formation for financial time series, that is, stock prices, stock indices, and so on. So how to identify whether there are Arsh processes in the volatility formation of our time series, that is, the Tesla stock price? Well, to do that, we have to turn to squared residuals, that is, the go-to estimator of um, volatility at a particular observation, and we have already calculated those uh, for prior tests, particularly for the bruce pagan test, and uh, please check out those videos to figure out how we've done that. But now we are concerned with whether abnormal returns in prior days cause volatility spikes in the current day. To do that, we have to just uh, calculate the autoregressive model for the squared residual. The logic is the following. First of all, it's called autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity for the reason. It means that there is an autoregressive process for the volatility, that is, for the squared residual. And second, how to uh, conceptualize high abnormal returns on the previous day. Well, we can precisely model it using lagged squared residuals. And uh, just as in um, various autoregressive tests we have uh, discussed quite a bit before, uh, we can take as many lags as we would like. However, the convention is that one lag is most certainly enough, especially if you're dealing with daily data. For high-frequency data, sometimes more lags are required but I will show you how to do the Arsh test with one lag and with multiple lags as well. So to do that, we first need to calculate the uh, lagged squared residuals. And we'll do it with one lags and with two lags, just to get a glimpse of a general concept. So for the squared residual lagged one, we just have to refer to the squared residual on the previous day. And bottom right click it all the way down. And for the lag two squared residuals, we have to refer to the squared residuals two days ago. And again, bottom right, you can it all the way down. And then we just have to regress our squared residual at the current observation onto lagged squared residual. 
So for the Arch 1 test, and the number in the parentheses here just identifies the number of flags we've taken, we just have to select a 5 by 2 array and apply the linest function. And uh, we need to select the squared residual, so just the squared residual we observe as our dependent variable. And here we have to account for the reduction in the number of observations um, due to our lag length. So here we do not generally fill in missing observations with zeros, as um, is uh, conventional in, in many autocorrelation tests. So we have to start with uh, the second observation and select the whole array after that. And as our independent variables, we'll just need to select the lag squared residual. Here we just have one independent variables and it is the squared residual lagged one day. And then we need to specify that we need the constant. That would be the unconditional volatility, that is the volatility that we would have expected if there would be no unexpected stock price movements in the prior day. And we also need the additional statistics reported to carry out with all of the testing. And then we enforce this formula with shift control enter and we look at the output. So, first of all, how can we test for the existence of Arch processes in the data? Well, if we just have one lag, we can just proceed with the usual t-stat, as we just have the one coefficient we uh, like to interpret. Here we see that we have some uh, unconditional volatility estimated here, and we have the impact of um, unexpected stock price movements in the prior day on the realized volatility in the following day. So this is the coefficient for significance of which we are going to test. For the t-test, we just calculate the usual t-stat. So we divide the coefficient by the standard error. We get a very high, higher than three, and a positive t-stat that already is a signal of pretty much statistical significance. Uh, also, what is um, notable for ARSH tests uh, generally, you would expect your coefficients to be positive because you expect there is going to be higher, not lower volatility after there are unexpected stock price movements. If you have negative significant coefficients for ARSH processes, it may signal misspecification or some weird behavior of your time series that you m might have to uh, investigate using some other techniques. But here we have um, everything as expected. We have significant positive uh, coefficient for our autoregressive volatility. For the t-test, we just need the two-tailed t-distribution, td is two-tailed, and we input our absolute value of the t-stat as the x variable and the number of the degrees of freedom as our um, second characteristic of the t-distribution. And we get almost zero. This p-value is so low that we can be certain that there is indeed arch heteroscedasticity in the time series. And it t teaches us something. Heteroscedasticity is so multidimensional. It can be so different that if you have uh, pretty, pretty high p-values in other tests, such as White, Gleiser, or Harvey, it needn't be that other types of heteroscedasticity are not plague in your data. So for heteroscedasticity detection, you need to be extra cautious and understand what the type of your data is to use the most appropriate test. And obviously, you would be the safest, you could be the most certain if you apply all of the tests in one go. And as we see, it's not that hard to do. Next um, way of testing for Irish effects is obviously to use the f-stat, and here uh, an f-stat and the t-stat for a linear regression with just one dependent variable uh, are going to give us exactly equivalent results, but let's just uh, double check. So for the f-stat we need to divide our r-squared by 1 minus r-squared uh, and multiply it by the number of the degrees of freedom, and we get 23 and a half, and then we apply the right-tailed F distribution for the first number of the degrees of freedom is just one, that's the number of factors in our regression, and uh, 1255 as the second number of our degrees of freedom, and we get exactly the same p-value as in the t-test. That's something we should have expected before. And for the chi-squared test, finally, 
um, the logic is pretty much the same as in all other chi-squared tests. That's the logic of uh, Lagrange multipliers, basically. So we just have to multiply the R squared by the number of observations. Bear in mind that we have reduced our sample size by one due to lagging. So we have to multiply by 1257, not 1258. And here we just apply the uh, chi-squared right tail distribution with one number of the degrees of freedom because we just have one lag and we get a very similar p-value indeed. For um, multi-parametric Arsh tests, you could use multiple lags of um, your squared residual. And we have already calculated the second lag of the squared residual, so we can just estimate our second uh, autoregressive model for the volatility and apply the linest function and input our squared residual as the dependent. Here we start from the third day due to loss of observations uh, as we lagged uh, two uh, squared residuals. And then as our independent variables, let's just select the two lagged squared residuals. And we need the constant that would signify our unconditional volatility and we need the additional statistics. So then we apply these formulas in ship control enter and look at the results. So first of all, we see that the uh, T stat, the, basically the coefficient in the standard error for the first lag didn't change pretty much at all. And uh, the coefficient for the second lag is very small. That's exactly what one would expect from the ARSH test uh, with multiple lags on daily data, as uh, generally the convention is that there are no uh, significant arch effects for lag length uh, greater than one. So here we can't test for the uh, existence of arch effects using individual T stats. So we just have to stick with the F test or the chi squared test. So let's do both. For the F stat, we have to divide the uh, R squared by one minus R squared, uh, multiplied by the number of the degrees of freedom and divide by the number of parameters in our regression. So by two and we get 11.76. And for the p-value, we again have to apply the f distribution, uh, input the f stat uh, two, because we have two factors again, and the number of the degrees of freedom of the whole regression. And we get again a very small, albeit slightly higher, p-value. That's because our results got a little bit diluted as we included the second lag that meant absolutely nothing for the general model and the behavior of the autoregressive squared residual. For the chi-squared stat, we again multiply the r-squared by the number of the observations, and here we have 1256 as we reduced our sample size by two due to, again, two lags we used, and we get 23.14, and here we apply the right-tailed chi-squared distribution with two degrees of freedom as we've got two lags. And again, the p-value is, again, very similar to, to the one we get from the f-stat. Uh, so what it means, first of all, uh, in most time series, especially financial time series, ARSH effects are very prominent. Most of the time, unexpected uh, abnormal returns on the previous day do cause volatility on the following day, and uh, it is well detectable using just uh, a one lag of squared residual, especially on daily data. For high-frequency data, you might want to use uh, the ARSH test with multiple lags, but again, this application is relatively fringe. If there is no heteroscasticity on one lag, then you can be uh, reasonably sure that your uh, time series volatility does not behave according to the ARSH law. Uh, what can one do when you detect heteroscasticity? Either the one from the goldfield Quan test, from bruch pagan test, from ARSH test? Well, there are various adjustments one can make to the model to account for this heteroscedicity and preserve the efficiency of your estimator. But that's something we're gonna talk in a lot of detail in the following series of videos on econometrics. This is all we've got to discuss on heteroscedicity tests. So please stay tuned for further videos on econometrics in our channel. 
please leave a like under this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any other suggestions on further videos on business, economics or finance you would like me to make. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click this notification button. Thank you very much and stay tuned.